from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors this broadcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us on this program a gentleman by the name of Jerry Taylor, who is now associated with the Cato Institute. He's one of uh, the country's leading experts on issues involving energy, global warming, etc. And years ago, when we were both much younger, he was associated with us at the Conservative Caucus. Jerry, thank you very much for coming. And one of the things on which we're going to focus in this broadcast is, quote unquote, global warming. Now, 10 years ago, I don't think anybody used the term global warming, uh, or at least it was not in the public discourse to the degree that it has been. How did global warming uh, become uh, a subject of discussion? Uh, was this Al Gore? Was it uh, people pushing in the run-up to Kyoto? How, how did it become an issue? Well, it actually st came from uh, a great deal of concern about uh, in, uh, how industrial activity may have been changing the climate from the 1970s. Uh, you may recall that uh, the 1970s was actually a very cold period. And for a brief period of time, there were a lot of stories about global cooling. I remember that in high school, and where uh, there were taught and there was talk about the overdue ice age and whatnot, and how we've seen uh, uh, cooling temperatures since World War II. And that didn't quite pan out, but it did create a little bit of a flurry. But that touched off research about industrial activity and how it might affect the climate. And uh, when the temperature trends reversed in the 1980s and began to warm up a bit, uh, there were a lot of climate researchers on the job. And the first time it really got some traction was when James Hansen, who's a scientist at NASA, testified in front of the Senate in 1986, I believe. So it was more than 10 years. It it's was been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. And, and Hansen's testimony about how it's beginning to look like industrial activity is warming the climate is what touched off uh, the uh, slow buildup of uh, conversation on the subject till we, we're out, we are where we are now. How did it go from that to Kyoto? And tell us what Kyoto is. Well, the Kyoto, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was signed in 1997 under the Clinton administration. Uh, from 1986 through that time, there was increasing concern about global warming, increasing evidence that the, that the world had indeed been warming, and increasing amount of circumstantial evidence that industrial activity had something to do with this. Uh, now, of course, throughout the uh, early 19 and mid-1990s, there was an uptick in political interest in uh, environmental issues for various reasons, and it played itself out in global warming. Now, uh, it's also convenient because the left for a long time has spent a great deal of effort trying to convince us the world was about to end. Uh, so this is sort of a, a standard narrative that the environmentalists have offered. Of course, once it was going to be because of overpopulation, and then the world was going to end because of industrial pollution and industrial cancers, and that, that, didn't, that didn't play out. Then the world was going to end from various uh, assortment of causes, and so global warming just kind of came along the path. It turns out, however, there might be more to this than some of these past scares, uh, but it uh, fit very nicely into the uh, left of center narrative about how industrial civilization is going to kill us. And I think that's how we got to the Kyoto Protocol, which again was signed in 1997, uh, and it obligated the United States to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 7% below 1990 levels by the year 2012. Uh, the United States signed it, but we never ratified it. And so it's essentially a dead letter in the United States. And, Bo and George Bush withdrew Clinton's signature. Well, Clinton signed it, but he never put it in front of the Senate. I mean, a, a presidential <coughs> signature in a quarter by a cup of coffee, as far as a treaty is concerned, it has to get past the Senate. Uh, but right before the Kyoto uh, summit, uh, the United States Senate took a vote uh, on uh, various issues related to global warming, uh, and an amendment by Howard, by excuse me, by uh, Senator Byrd, to uh, instruct U.S. delegates not to sign a treaty which did not include China and India and other third world uh, uh, industrial actors passed 98 to nothing. Well, the Kyoto Treaty did not include China, it did not include India, uh, and even the Democratic Senate back then was not about to pass it. So Clinton, though having signed the bill, never put it in front of the uh, United States. And the reasoning of Senator Robert Byrd was, in addition to affecting the West Virginia coal industry, uh, it would uh, place the United States at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It put the United States at an industrial disadvantage because it would be paying higher prices for energy than other countries. But if there was a single government or a single person pushing the Kyoto Agreement, drafting it, getting people to sign on. Can you identify who that was? Well, Al Gore was the main engine behind this effort. Uh, it was uh, Gore who uh, talked the Clinton uh, administration into uh, an aggressive stance on climate change. 
It was Al Gore who talked uh, President Clinton into uh, investing political capital on the issue. Uh, Clinton had never been particularly interested in these issues until uh, Gore was gearing up for the White House. Uh, and so it was President Gore who, or excuse me, Vice President Gore who also He would have been president Canada. if he had <laughs> supported the conviction of uh, Bill Clinton. Well, he might very well have been. <laughs> but it was in the final days of the Kyoto summit, uh, the treaty was, uh, was at a loggerheads and the Vice President flew out to Japan uh, in the final days and helped uh, wrap up the deal. So that was very much an Al Gore treaty. Uh, what was the role of the United Nations in pushing the treaty? Well, the United Nations uh, has set up something called the International Panel <clears throat> on Climate Change, which is a body of uh, several thousand scientists that uh, meets every five years or so to issue a report to the world's leadership about the state of climate science, uh, and that occurs under the UN auspice. And then uh, the UN has sponsored uh, continuing international confabs uh, like Kyoto, and we had recently <coughs> one in Montreal. Uh, where uh, countries get together to discuss uh, joint action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the UN serves as sort of a talking chamber. It's a, it's a place which, uh, it's an organization which organizes meetings, uh, pu uh, sent, puts out information to help encourage countries to sign on to these sorts of activities. Uh, but of course, they can't unilaterally do very much. It just uh, it throws a party and hopes people attend. Now, President Bush came under a great deal of criticism for not supporting Kyoto. And uh, he came forward with some uh, supposed uh, compromise or uh, partial measures or measure, non-Kyoto measures to deal with the issue. What were some of those? Well, the president, uh, his, his program is largely based on research and development of, uh, of uh, technologies which produce little greenhouse gases. And he hopes in the long run, if you throw enough tax dollars at, say, hydrogen-powered fuel cells and renewable energy and clean coal and you know various other uh, assortment of uh, energy technologies and industries you'll eventually um, subsidize your way into a, uh, a more environmentally friendly industrial economy uh, that's the president's policy it's one that's recently been embraced by tony blair as well uh, he is now uh, arguing exactly the same thing uh, as the president uh, and uh, that's been the uh, president's policy since kyoto um, what is the uh, status of the kyoto agreement well, it's, it's, uh, it was signed by a group of European countries, uh, as well as Australia and uh, Canada. And uh, those nations are trying uh, their best to make it work, but it's not working very well. Uh, for instance, uh, the U.S. emissions uh, since the treaty was signed are up by about 13 uh, percent. They're up by twice that amount in Canada, even though Canada has signed on to the treaty. Uh, they are up in most parts of Europe as well. So just signing the treaty doesn't mean anything's really been accomplished. I mean, the Kyoto Protocol, in essence, is an international promise made on New Year's Eve that says next August I'm going to diet and I'm going to lose 10 pounds a month, details to come later. So, so far it hasn't really amounted to very much. Um, is there global warming? Well, it's unclear. Uh, we know that the world has warmed by about one degree Fahrenheit since uh, 1900. Uh, we know that half of that warming, however, occurred before World War II, and very few scientists attribute that to global warming. They attribute that to a recovery from the Little Ice Age. And then from World War II through 1970, temperatures cooled slightly. And then from the uh, late 1970s onward, they've increased quite a bit. Uh, how much of that is due to industrial activity is unclear. Uh, there are some scientists who believe that it's probably due more to solar activity than anything else. With sunspots and whatnot, there's a different amount of uh, solar radiation that hits the Earth on any given uh, period of time. And that, can, that correlates actually very nicely with temperature changes. Uh, some scientists think it may just be random noise. I mean, the climate changes quite a bit. We go through ice ages and warm periods and whatnot without any industrial activity as an explanatory variable. So it could very well be that. Uh, but the circumstantial evidence that we have, which is not dispositive, but it certainly suggests that industrial activity probably explains some of the warming. But how much is very much in dispute, and we can't know it for certain for probably another decade or two. Yeah. If you were king of the world, uh, how would you address, and we had global warming conclusively, uh, how serious a problem would you consider it to be? And if you considered it to be serious, how would you address it? It doesn't look very serious so far. I mean, after all, we've already seen the planet warm by about a degree Fahrenheit uh, over 100 years, and what have we seen also in that period of time? We saw a uh, tremendous creation of wealth, improvements in standard of living, increases in per income, uh, uh, of annual uh, per capita income. We've seen life expectancy explode. We've seen tremendous good things associated with it. Uh, the fact is our economy is not particularly vulnerable to temperature. Uh, it's very hard to envision scenarios where warming at that moderate level uh, has any significant effect. And uh, though there's a chance that things could deteriorate in the future, there's, I think a small chance, the right policy, I think, is simply to allow the economy to continue to create wealth. 
the main reason we're less vulnerable to climate change than, say, India or Pakistan or something like that. Is the United States is a very wealthy country. Uh, it can adjust to temperatures very easily without great effort. Uh, and in fact, most of the economists who looked at this said, global warming probably won't make any difference in the United States. It won't make any difference in Japan. It won't make any difference in Europe. It won't make any difference in the industrialized world because it will have a trivial effect on these countries. Uh, it's the poor countries uh, that cannot adjust, that cannot adapt, that, have, uh, that don't have the green revolution yet, that aren't very productive, that rely heavily upon uh, human and animal labor for crops and whatnot that may well be harmed. Those nation states need to, need to grow. They need to create wealth, and that's the best insurance against something bad happening in the future with climate. Well, let's switch gears and uh, talk about uh, recent developments on Capitol Hill uh, with respect to energy legislation. We may have to cover most of this after the break. But give me a, a general review of how Congress has been addressing energy issues. Uh, Congress has, in my opinion, acted uh, terribly on energy issues. Uh, when, when I was young, uh, the Reagan administration talked about abolishing the Department of Energy and argued that uh, it has never produced a single unit of energy in its history, never will, and that there's nothing wrong with the energy economy that uh, capitalism and free markets couldn't solve. Do you think he was right? I think he was absolutely right. What about the defense aspects of the Energy Department? Well, the defense aspects of the Energy Department could be undertaken by the Defense Department. Right. After all, if we're going to get rid of the Department of Defense, somebody needs to keep an eye on the nuclear stockpile. Somebody sure. needs to police the nonproliferation agreements. But those things can be done by the State Department and the Defense Department. Why was the Energy Department created, and how was it created? Well, it was created uh, under President Jimmy Carter, and uh, what it did, it took a lot of different agencies that are already out there, the Federal Energy Agency and uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a lot of different uh, organizations, and threw them all into one uh, pot. Uh, so it really didn't create very many new programs, but it sort of reorganized the flow chart. So now we had a secretary of energy who could sit at the cabinet table and that sort of thing. Jerry, we have to take a break. We'll be back right after these messages to learn more about the energy issues confronting our country. Stay with us and hear from uh, one of America's top experts in this area, Jerry Taylor of the Cato Institute. We'll be right back. One of the top leaders in the Communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible and uh, as a result of the extra money they have they're not only taking jobs from the United States they're increasing their military budget by 17 percent a year it's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China the conservative caucus www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626 Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruca and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper. And call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Help the Arbor Day Foundation plant more trees across the nation. Plant a tree today for all the world to share. Go to arborday.org. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks a lot for all you guys have done. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you! Thank you. Welcome back. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I'm Howard Phillips with Jerry Taylor of the Cato Institute. You may have seen Jerry on television. He appears frequently as a guest on CNN, NPR, MSNBC, CNBC, Fox News, Bloomberg, Public Radio International, the BBC, etc. Uh, he's testified frequently on Capitol Hill. Uh, he's uh, written a number of policy studies, contributed to several anthologies, and uh, he knows everything you would want to know about energy. We were talking uh, just before the break about the way Congress has dealt with energy issues. Tell me more. Well, Congress's uh, strategy has been to subsidize pretty much every energy industry that's got a lobbyist on Capitol Hill. Uh, the oil industry, the gas industry, the coal industry, the renewable energy industry, the wind energy, the solar industry, hydrogen-powered fuels industries. Uh, basically, their idea is that if you throw enough money at the energy industry, you'll get more energy uh, for, your, for your actions. Uh, and so that's been strategy number one. Strategy number two has been to act opportunistic with regards to uh, public opinion and oil companies. Uh, few people realize that after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, that free market Republican Congress ended up voting for laws uh, establishing a federal uh, price gouging bill, which is essentially price controls under certain times and conditions. Uh, and in the Senate, 58 or 57 senators voted for a windfall profits tax, irrespective of what it did the last time we had a windfall profits tax, which was to devastate the energy industry. And uh, Republicans who voted for that bill include people like John Sununu from New Hampshire, conservative, who I like personally, but uh, he, even he cast his vote uh, in that direction. It didn't get into the bill because it was two, uh, three votes shy. Yeah, his daddy this. was the one who gave us David Souter. Yes, so uh, <laughs> the point is is that Republicans don't act very principled here. They say they believe in free markets, but when it comes to energy, they don't. Uh, they say they believe in uh, capitalism and letting uh, uh, entrepreneurs and businessmen decide what to invest their money in and, uh, and how to run an industry, except when it comes to energy. Then we hold hearings about these things. And well, recently they brought uh, before uh, their committees leaders of the major energy corporations in America, and they browbeat them about the high price of gasoline. And uh, not every one of them handled themselves expertly. Uh, clearly, uh, Congress has no constitutional basis for interfering with uh, the work of the energy corporations. What is the reason for the fluctuating price of gasoline at the pump? It's largely driven by oil prices. I mean, the gasoline prices are high because world oil prices are high, and 85% of the variance in gasoline price can be explained by the variance in crude oil prices. And right now, crude oil prices are high. The reason that is is that about every 20 years or so, the oil industry goes through a boom period in which supplies are tight and prices are high. Uh, what happens is, is that as a response to these sorts of booms, industries pour <coughs> billions of dollars into new production and new supply and investment. When those new supplies come online, prices collapse, and then for about 20 years, the industry lives off all that excess production capacity it was bought for, bought and paid for during the last price spiral. And then uh, slowly over time, all that excess production capacity disappears. And then once that 20 years or so is up, you see very little excess production capacity. Demand ends up uh, driving up price. And we go through the same thing all over again. So it's just a, it's a cyclical industry. Prices move cyclically. And it's been about 20 years since the last boom. So this one's occurring at about the right time. To what degree are prices at high levels because of the failure of our country to develop its own energy <coughs> resources offshore, in Alaska, elsewhere? Not much. Uh, the fact is, is U.S. Uh, production is only about 1% of world crude oil production, and it's world crude oil supply and world crude oil demand that establishes domestic price. Not U.S. supply and demand, world supply and demand, because this is a global market for oil. Even if we had opened up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, we might see U.S. production move from about 1.5% of global uh, production to maybe one and three quarters of a percent. Uh, that's not enough to have much effect on world crude prices. So even though it may make sense to drill in Anwar, and it may make sense to drill offshore, and that might have some positive effect on price, it's not really what's going on here. What's really going on here is a cyclical market uh, that's in a boom phase, but it will soon bust. And uh, it's largely in a boom phase because of demand in China and India. Uh, they're driving the world crude markets. Uh, their economies are growing at 10% a year. And they're not just driving world, world crude prices, they're driving the price of steel, and all sorts of other chemicals and industrial inputs. So that's really the story. I, I remember back in the 70s, I was shocked by an article in Fortune magazine quoting Henry Kissinger as indicating we might have to go to war in the Middle East to protect American access to energy, to oil. And it just seemed to me to be the height of immorality to uh, be willing to kill people 
for the sake of uh, access to oil. But apparently that's what we're doing in Iraq and what we've done <coughs> elsewhere. Well, I can't read mine, so I'm not sure why or what really uh, made uh, George Bush and Dick Cheney and the Republicans decide to uh, go to war in Iraq either the first or the second time. The first time they declared it had a lot to do with oil. I think it had, around, to do with, had uh, it had a lot to do with Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. and the Kuwait Petroleum Corporation, on which the United Kingdom depended heavily. And I think that uh, Mrs. Thatcher was a big factor in pushing the first Bush into war. The real tragedy here is that's unnecessary. If that's the motive, it's unnecessary. The fact is, is even the most radically <clears throat> anti-American regimes have to put oil on the world market or they disappear because they have no other source of income. Even Hugo Chavez. Hugo Chavez, well. in fact, is trying to increase production. Ayatollah Khomeini, once he gained power in Iran, was more than happy to sell oil to the world market. They need our money more than we need their oil, and no country, no matter how anti-American, is going to commit economic suicide by strangling the United States. So the idea that we need to use military arms to get oil, say, out of Iraq is nuts. Saddam Hussein wanted to sell us oil. We had an embargo preventing him to do it. So there is just no reason to go to war for that. There might be other reasons, but the idea that we need military power to ensure access to foreign oil in my opinion, is egregiously wrong. You know, one of the uh, interesting developments in recent years in our country is uh, how many people who consider themselves environmental activists have decided to buy uh, cars like the Toyota Prius, and uh, Honda has a car which uh, uh, supposedly saves on energy. And I've driven in <coughs> some of these cars. They're very nice cars. But the reality is uh, they're really not saving uh, that much uh, oil and they're very expensive for the owners. The owners are paying much more uh, even with a tax break uh, for the extra cost of those vehicles than they're saving in the uh, in the gas that uh, is not being purchased. What uh, do you think is likely to happen in the United States in the years ahead insofar as energy conservation is concerned? Will people use less uh, gas at the pump? Will we uh, see uh, more practical uses of solar energy, wind energy, and so forth? Or are things going to be pretty much as they are now? Well, as far as conservation is concerned, when prices go up, people conserve. The reason there hasn't been a lot of conservation investment in the 1980s and 1990s is that after 1986, prices collapsed and energy was at w historic lows. In fact, the lowest price of oil ever recorded in modern history was in 1998. Uh, and there's not going to be a lot of conservation when those situations are in place. But when prices are high and rising, people will react. Now, <coughs> one thing economists tell us is that they don't conserve much in the short run. But if the prices linger and stay high for more than a couple of years, they do indeed. And the f reason for that is it costs a lot of money to shift, and it's a lot of time and effort to, say, shift from where you live, which might be an hour and a half from where you work, to buy a house closer to where you work because you don't want those transit costs. Or to go ahead and trade in your SUV and get a more fuel-efficient car. Uh, or to make investments regarding home heating conservation and whatnot. Over the long run, people can serve very robustly when faced with a high price. But over the short run, they don't necessarily do that because they're not sure how long those prices will be there. We're in a phase now where we're seeing major conservation investments. These prices have been around for a while. And we're going to see the market accomplish more conservation than anything the government can do. As far as alternatives to oil and gasoline, the problem is, is that it's a, we're a very long ways from having a competitive source of uh, energy to oil. For instance, in Europe, they have gasoline taxes, which essentially make a gallon equivalent of gasoline cost somewhere between 6 to $8 a gallon. Those are phenomenally high prices that most of us couldn't even imagine. Yet in Europe, even paying 6 to $8 a gallon, you don't see alternatives to fuel to conventional fire gasoline uh, automobiles. That's, that's how far away alternatives to oil and gasoline are from being competitive. If you can't compete when gasoline prices are 6 to $8 a gallon, you're a long way from being able to compete in the United States for a market. We'll be back right after these messages with Jerry Taylor. Face the Truth is a production of the Conservative Caucus and is seen twice monthly on the station you are watching. We will be interviewing the movers and shakers of the pro-life movement. We hope to educate and even inspire you about what is being done in our country to protect and to promote the sanctity of life. Please watch us. Don't miss Face the Truth with Stephen Peruka and Conservative Roundtable with Howard Phillips right here on this station every week. The very first clause in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 1, immediately following the preamble, asserts that all legislative powers herein granted 
shall be vested in a Congress of the United States consisting of a Senate and a House of Representatives. All legislative powers, that means you cannot give other entities the power to legislate, not the United Nations or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or the federal judiciary or regulatory agencies or federally funded private organizations. If you're going to stick to the Constitution, only the Congress can make policy and the Conservative Caucus works to assure that Congress will more nearly conform to the Constitution. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org, 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on this program, please check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org. Check out my blog, howardphillips.com, or write to us at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Our guest this evening has been Jerry Taylor of the Kennedy, excuse me, of the Cato Institute. Jerry, how can people get in touch with you? He's written some great things. You may want to contact him to get information about his writings, get copies of them. Well, the best thing to do is to go to our website at www.cato, that's C-A-T-O dot org, uh, and we have a great search engine. Just type in what you're interested in finding, and you'll find it all on our website. Cato is an outstanding organization. They've done a great job in so many areas. And, uh, Jerry, we've got about uh, 20 seconds. What, what is your last message to our audience? Well, my last message is keep up the good fight. I mean, I was a uh, young college student when you hired me for a few months uh, back in the day. And, uh, and uh, since then, it's been interesting to see where politics has gone. And I sometimes wonder, given how badly things go in Washington, anybody still manages to uh, keep the faith and keep the fight alive. And it's wonderful to see you doing that. And, well, we've got to fear God, not man, and as long as we do that, we'll be okay. Absolutely. Jerry, keep up your great work, and thank you so much uh, for giving up your time to be with us. We really appreciate it. It was a great program. Thank you so much.